Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Offshore Anchoring in Deeper Water, and I'm going to be talking to Captain Corbett Johnson of Relax Fishing Charters. He's got a boat working out of Moorhead, another boat working out of Beaufort, and we're going to be talking about anchor setups, checking your spot, uh, setting your course, and then we're going to finish with talking about how to fly the anchor. So we're all things anchoring in deeper water today. And my name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools. And now in our latest and greatest chapter, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights on how to catch more fish more often Albeit, I think the truer goal, the truer goal, though, is to get you and your family and your friends out on the water, spending more time together more often. In this endeavor, I am joined every episode with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Hey, Billy, welcome to another episode. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, man. Always a treat to be on the podcast with you. It is, man. I, I look forward to these podcast sessions. I am fond of them, fond of this project that we've undertaken. People seem to like it. And when people tell me that, I tell you, I'm glad you like it because I'm in, I'm having a good time too. I know, Gary. You've been telling me stories. You can't even walk into the local tackle shop anymore because you're bombarded. <laughs> people with <laughs> Sharpie <laughs> markers <laughs> opening up their button-up shirts wanting you to sign their chest. It's crazy. It's just it's wild. So, <laughs> yeah, the things podcasting can do for you, man. It's crazy. <laughs> man, I, I didn't know podcasting would test my marriage with groupies. Right? I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> with saltwater fishermen. Wow. Weird. <laughs> and making it all possible is our friends over at Marine Warehouse. I want to shout out a few of our sponsors, and we're going to start with Marine Warehouse. I got a quick video from them, and we'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Boom. Great, man. And there's Terrell once again. There sure. are there are guys, man. Sales, yeah. service, and parts. They are our guys. They are, as we say, not just trying to sell to the fishing and boating community, but they are part of the fishing and boating community. You know, whether it's tournaments or special events or what have you, man. Those guys are dynamic. Love the relationship. Always crushing it, man. Always wanting to give and support, and they support this show. So we really appreciate them. Um, and they give us a lot of joy and laughter. So thanks, Terrell. I'm sure. He well, they attempt. In. We'll say that Terrell <laughs> attempts. I believe he's more successful with you than with me. And I don't. I don't even know this, but Terrell must have like a three year old, you know, child who's feeding him these jokes, because that seems to be what we have here. I mean, I think if you think about it, you're going to be able to actually say the punchline of this joke. Right. Are you ready? I'm, I'm Terrell's joke. Terrell's joke, not mine. To be clear. Why are fish so smart? Asked the third grader. I mean, the three-year-old. I don't know. Because they spend all their time in schools. <laughs> all right, that was pretty good. That was. Pretty is it? Good. If is his, it pretty good? If his three, if he has a three-year-old that's feeding him those jokes, that is a clever three-year-old. So good for the three-year-old. Terrell, you still have a little work to do. So make sure you guys. And if he doesn't have a three year old, <laughs> he needs to put down the bottle. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to shout out a couple other sponsors here, real quick. We've got RA Hitch, uh, Raleigh Apex area. They are hooking you guys up. They're taking care of you with trailers, hitches, bike racks, so much more. Uh, we know as anglers, you're not just one dimensional, just fishing, but you're outdoors men, outdoors ladies, and you're doing the thing. So go up there and let them take care of you and help you outfit your rig to make it more convenient for your next camping trip, fishing trip, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, Gary, have you went up there and bought that roof rack yet for the for the thing? I have not. So here's the th I just need a reason to head that way. I mean, I actually 
spend more time. You would think I'm fishing all the time, but I'm spending more time in this office. I need a reason to head west. And once I do, I am making that. Per I have stated for the record, I am making that purchase. All right, man. Well, most I'm likely. Gonna... Chris, he's on his way. He said it here today. He's there. He might be <laughs> there right. already by the time this episode airs. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I might the... already be a customer. <laughs> we have another sponsor. I want to shout these guys out really quickly is Manscaped. Uh, so you guys can go to manscaped.com and use promo code FISHPOST and get your 20% off plus your free shipping. Uh, if you don't know what Manscaped is, eh, just think about it for a minute. It's uh, <laughs> tools to make you better feel better i don't know <laughs> anyway that hairy yeah. chest that we talked about just go ahead and shave it <laughs> i have no idea gary i'm gonna pass the mic to you <laughs> all right you know what i have we have a regular feature billy and this is the manscape quiz oh, okay the manscape quiz so what i have for you today is i have two catch lines two tag lines one is an actual tagline that Manscaped uses. Manscaped uses. Mm -hmm. Another is one that, to my knowledge, Manscaped does not use. Your goal is to pick the one that is false, the one that is made up, the one that Manscaped doesn't use. Are you ready? I'm ready. Catchphrase number one. Is your tiger lost in the jungle? Catchphrase number two. Show you care by caring for your pair. <laughs> All right. I believe the first one is false. Is your tiger hiding in the jungle? <laughs> Lost. Lost in the jungle. I want to say that one's fake. I want to say that's a fake one. That is the fake one. You're very good at this game. I don't think you've gotten one wrong of the whole series. Yes. I'm good. Good man. for you. I know those sponsors. And speaking of sponsors, if you want to be a sponsor, Feel free to reach out to me, Billy at fishermanspost.com. If you have a business that is catering to the outdoorsmen, the fishing community, the watermen, uh, we would love to have that conversation with you. And then also, if you want to support Gary and I as creators, you can head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fishermanspost and buy us a cup of joe and keep us caffeinated. Man, let's, uh, let's transition to a fish photo. Let's go. Here we are with... AJ Candy with a or Canada with a 17 pound hogfish that fell for a barefoot decoy jig with squid. He was fishing in 120 feet of water off Topsail Island. Uh, Gary, I don't know that much about hogfish, but that thing looks pretty tasty. Man, pretty it is often quoted as the best tasting bottom fish around. Often, I mean, of course, everyone has a different opinion. That's why I say is often quoted as one of their favorites. Hmm, being a hogfish, bacon. Can you make bacon from the hogfish? <laughs> Just curious. Yes. Let yes, me know you in the can. comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, let me know in the comments if you've made bacon from hogfish. <laughs> That's a great question. Oh, that is, man. You are definitely establishing us as the go-to <laughs> resource for all things fishing in North Carolina. Dude, I'm like the number one guy. Just ask me anything. I can make, <laughs> I mean, I can tell you stuff. <laughs> anyway, Gary, let's talk about let's talk to somebody who actually knows something about fishing. How about that? Yeah, man, I'm excited about this. Uh, what I'll also tell our viewers and listeners is Corbett Johnson, Captain Corbett Johnson, I'm getting ready to uh, introduce to you guys, was a suggestion from a viewer, from a listener. And we tell you regularly, we look for your feedback, whether it's topic ideas or whether it's guest ideas. We appreciate you. And here's one coming to fruition. Um, before I bring up Corbett Johnson, though, just one reminder, Billy. You got to stay tuned. You got to stay awake because at the end of the episode, I'm coming back to you for Billy's best takeaway. Why awake, man? I'm ready for it. All right. Well, let's bring, let's not, we've talked enough. Let's bring on our guest, our talent, Captain Corbett Johnson of Relax Fishing Charters, working out of Moorhead, working out of Beaufort. Man, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for doing this podcast with us. Yes, sir. How are we this evening? Man, we're doing good. And again, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm so glad that someone reached out and suggested you. And what we're going to do here before we get into the material of offshore anchoring in deeper water, as is tradition on this podcast, man, I got two questions for you. We got to do two questions before we can get to the main event. If you're ready, Corbett, I'm going to give you question number one. All right. What you got? All right. First question is, why should we listen to what you have to say about anchoring? Why should we keep watching, keep listening? Oh, well, I, I own and operate Relax Fishing Charters. I, we've got two boats. We kind of fish everywhere from Ocean City, Maryland to 
down to Marathon, Florida, and most of our fishing is based right out of Moorhead City here in North Carolina. Um, we also had a grouper snapper permit uh, for, for a good handful of years, and we do, do a lot of bottom fishing. Sometimes we get lucky and catch fish. We do a lot of fishing, sometimes we catch the fish. Well, right on, man. I'm a uh... Uh, that certainly works. I'm in. But as is tradition, question number two is a non-fishing related question. Are you ready for question number two? Yes, sir. All right, man. Well, I, I did a play on Corbett. It sounds to me a little bit like Corvette. So your question has to do with the Chevrolet Corvette. Are you ready for your Corvette question? Yes, sir. You got, what's your best guess as to how much the first Corvette retailed for in 1953? First Corvette, 1953, take a guess at the retail price. I have no clue, honestly, but probably only like 30 grand. 30 grand? That should be my guess. I have no clue that. Well, we would take a zero off of that, and it would be 3,500 bucks. Uh, I was shocked, too. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I'm not playing this off at all like I knew this. I mean, I'm Googling this stuff, and I was shocked, too. 3500 bucks would have gotten you a Corvette back in 1953, man. But it. let's talk. Not even that long ago. <laughs> let's talk about anchoring, and it is something that I wish I was stronger at. You know, I even when I go on the boats with my captains, I try to pay attention, and I just never seem to click it in. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And I think what we said is we're going to start – just with telling me like your preference for, you know, your anchoring gear, your anchoring setup. So what anchor do you like and how do you rig it out? So my preference is going to be a little different than a lot of people's and it's all going to be based on how big your boat is, right? Um, so that 34 foot boat that, I, that we fish on is, is a heavier boat and we actually fish a 75 pound anchor with 70 foot of chain. Definitely wouldn't recommend that for most people. Um, more so if it's the style of the anchor. It's like a little short, stubby anchor. Um, and the main shaft of the anchor is like double supported. It's an inch, inch and a half piece of rebar in the middle with a piece of two inch um, square tubing around it. Because um, the way we pull the anchor, you'll end up bending um, the shank of the anchor pretty much every time. So that has more so to do with it than the amount of chain or, or anything. Um, but I'd always recommend way more chain than you think you need. Um, when we're anchoring up in, say we're anchoring in 300 foot of water, we've only got 350 foot anchor rope out, maybe. So you go heavy, both because you have a heavy boat, plus you just like the heavy anchor setup. And, and, and you know, it's going to set immediately. But let, let's say you're in a a 24 foot center console, I, I probably wouldn't do any more than a 25 pound anchor, a 20 pound anchor, but you just want to make sure that the shaft you, you've got, it's not the regular anchor that you go buy from West Marine that you've got your buddy that welds or, or you know, somebody, or you've gone and got it from like a custom shop or a shop that makes them. Um, we get them from a place in St. Petersburg that has a little bit extra beef in the shaft or you'll definitely, you'll bend it and you, you'll waste a hundred dollar anchor very, very quickly. So look to beef up the shaft if you're getting sort of an over-the-counter or look for a custom anchor. Just go online. That's sort of the recommendation there. And then if it was a, say, a 24, 27-foot center console, and we're talking more of a 20, 25-pound anchor, I'm guessing we're not talking 70 feet of anchor, I mean, of chain there. What's? Do you have any idea what's pretty standard for something that size? I, on, a, on a smaller boat like that, on a center console, we'll generally fish like 20 or 25 foot of chain. Um, and that's generally you can't go wrong with more. It's just a matter of, you know, who, whose back's pulling it in at the end of the day. Because you still have to do some hossing on the chain, even no matter how what method you pull the anchor in, unless you've got some fancy electronics. And then uh, I heard you say that for your boat, you know, you'll go with 350 foot of rope, even if you're in anchoring in 300 feet of water, because your chain and anchor setup is that stout to applying it to like our 25, 27 foot center console, certainly they're going to need a little bit more than 50 feet of extra. Is You got any recommendations there? Just a standard 300, is that pretty standard to have 300, 300 feet of feet of rope? Well, it, if you have a heavier, more chain, um, not necessarily even the heavier anchor, but just more chain enables you to be able to do that. Cause you, you know, especially if you're only anchoring in 150 foot of water and, and say you've got 40 foot of chain, 
then you you're already got an extra 40 foot out so i you know you put an extra 50 or 60 foot out it's kind of all depending on conditions and and really where the fish are sometimes you find you anchor up and you don't mark any fish and you you, you want to let more anchor line out or vice versa all right man i i think i'm following the conversation so far and so now let's talk about the process so i know you know, I know in talking from you and even already that you do some commercial fishing, you do some guide fishing. So when you have, we'll, we'll at least start it when you have clients on the boat, more of a, you know, a more standard trip, like the audience of this podcast might be undertaking themselves. So if you've got clients on the boat, you're taking them out bottom fishing, you got your spot in mind, you're pulling up to your mark, you're pulling up to your spot. So, you know, treat me like a beginner, man, and walk me through the process of, of how you set the anchor when you've got guests on the boat and you're getting ready to go do some bottom fishing. All right. So we'll, we'll basically pull up and first we'll kind of do a couple circles around it. Sometimes you don't, you don't mark any fish there. And uh, if, if you don't mark any fish, if you don't mark any fish, we'll just keep moving and um, go on to the, to the next area or wherever. And then, so when we do mark fish, we'll, um, that that's when we'll stop and I'll let my party drop down or whoever's with me drop down and see if anything's biting or, or there and be, be the first step. So you're going to drop a hook down before you're going to sort of drift it a little bit and just to see what's down there before you even go with the anchor. I didn't quite follow that. Yes, yeah, sir. Yep. Yep. We're going to pull up. We're, we're going to mark the fish for, first, um, you know, and make sure there's life and everything on our bottom machine. Um, once, once we've confirmed there's life there, I'll, I'll stop right on top of, of the number wherever we want to fish and let somebody drop down. Um, and that, that does two things. That sees if the fish are there, and it also tells us which way we're drifting. So it kind of works out for, for both there. Okay, so I like that technique. And you're dropping down just to see what's happening, and then you're also setting up your drift. So that's pretty standard protocol from what I understand is like, let the boat drift to see how the current, how the wind is moving you before you even come up with a plan for how you're going to get set on your spot. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Because um, so sometimes you'll come and there'll be, even if the fish are biting, there'll be too much current. You know, I've, we, we've been on trips where we pulled up and there was two and a half knots of current and we just kept driving. Um, you know, we end up driving for, on a commercial trip, it's different than on a charter. You got less time on a charter, but um, you end up driving just to get away from the current sometimes. So that's that's a big factor too, making sure it's even fishable before you actually take the anchor out and, and all that good stuff. What, in your opinion, what kind, what what's the deal breaker on current? Like, what's the mark? Like, this is too much, and this is we're not going to fish it, but this amount is fishable. It all depends on what you want to deal with. You know, it's right. like. If I'm going with my dad or something like that, it's going to be a little different than like with the charter or, or, you know, you got five or six people in the back of the boat. You, it's very, very hard to deal with more than like a knot and a half. Um, you, everybody's getting tangled up. Your weights are way back there and you can deal with it. Um, but everybody's using heavier weights and it's not. A lot of times about a knot and a half is kind of the edge where we start running from it. It's fishable up to like two knots. But any more than that, you you really don't ever even touch the bottom. All right. I follow that. And so now what we've done is we've drift and you'll let it drift. Like how far, like, or how many minutes will you drift just to feel like you've got an accurate drift course? Well, I try not to drift too far, more than four or 500 feet. Um, Cause you, a lot of times or sometimes you'll pull the fish off the number. Um, so I'll, I'll drift maybe four or 500 foot at the most. And then once you figured out how you're drifting, then what do you do? You've got your, on your machine, on your electronics, you're seeing how you're being pushed away from the spot, whether it's, you know, tide, wind, or both, current wind, or both. Then what happens once you see that course of how you've been pushed off the spot? All right. So let's say that you're, you, you're drifting and now you look back at your machine and it says the bearing two waypoint or whatever is now 180 degrees, right? So that means you need to go, you're drifting 180 degrees away from that. So you drive back to, well, you get your anchor and everything ready and get your, your anchor ready to deploy on the other side of it. And then you turn back around and drive 180 degrees straight back to that mark that you were planning on fishing on. And you're going to go up in front of that number 
two, three hundred feet, depending on how much current there is. You know, you have to kind of be the judge of that by how how fast your boat's drifting. Um, and get up current of it and throw your anchor in the water, tie it off, and see where he lands. Is generally, the second step there. And so, how many times, like, if you're, how many times do you get it right the first time? Like, you know, where you go two or three hundred yards past it or feet past it drop your anchor, you followed your anchor course. I mean, does that usually work out or does it just sort of, you know, get wonky and you got to, it usually takes a couple times to get it right. It's kind of 50, 50, um, just throwing it in the water like that. Eh, if it's deep, you know, if it's shallow, the anchor doesn't have very far to go. So it, it gets to the bottom pretty quick and it settles and you don't miss them very much. And then kind of depends if the spots real big or small. A lot of the better better areas are smaller places, smaller spots to anchor up on. Um, but like in a, a deeper situation, you got a lot of variables, the wind and the current. By the time the anchor gets down there, I'd say maybe 75% of the time you miss it if you just drop the anchor and try to land on it. I do anyway. So I consider missing it, landing more than 20 foot from it. I guess, um, and a question I guess I'm sort of wondering about is like when you – when you set your drift path and then you have your course and then you drive past it and you drop your anchor and do you usually like when you throw the anchor and the anchor comes taut is that usually the same exact direction that you would when you drift or is there something about anchoring up that will sometimes change the angle and you won't be on the same angle that you are when you're just simply drifting without holding fast well so sometimes there'll be more wind the you know on the on the surface it, versus current you'll end up laying what we call laying side two with the side of your boat into the swell or whatever and it's it is kind of definitely you don't always lay exactly how you drift but about 65 75 percent of the time you do um it could conditions where there's no wind or anything like that or, or the tides going opposite of the wind and there's a lot of it are the only times that it's majorly different than how you'll drift Man, uh, I know we're going to talk about flying the anchor, but I feel like we need to spend a little bit more time on this before we move on. What What do you got for me as far as like mistakes people make or, or any kind of tips that you would suggest for even for people that are pretty good at it? I mean, what else do we have in this category about, you know, making sure we're as close to on our spot as we'd like to be? Um, well, if you, if you, it's pretty much just knowing your drift right there, knowing how much extra anchor rope you've got out. You know, it's that's that's kind of the whole deal with fishing a short short anchor rope. If it's if it's not enough to hold it, obviously it's not enough. But if you're fishing right on top of your anchor, you're not drifting around, you're not swinging around or anything like that. So let's say you're fishing in a hundred foot of water, but you've got a bunch of scope out and you've got two hundred foot of anchor rope that's a hundred foot in a round circle that you can swing around so that, that potentially if you're swinging in the tide puts you that far off of your off the fish every time to the point where you might catch fish for 20 minutes and then might not for 45 minutes so i want to watch how much ideally we watch how much line we have out just because it creates a less room for error with the less line we have is that did i hear that is that what we're saying that's right. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much right, right on top of it. And you, and and then I guess the other thing would be you always want to be mindful that you don't drag, try not to drag your anchor right through the fish. Yeah, I figure if you're a fish down there and you see this big giant anchor, airplane looking thing, spaceship looking thing come flying over your head, you're probably out of there. So, <laughs> kind of want to make sure you're far enough up in front of them that if you do miss it, that you you don't slide past it. You're up in front of it or off to the side of it or something. Um, that makes sense. I, I follow that too. So as far as anchoring on the spot, I mean, I guess the ideal scenario is, you know, you come tight at the beginning of where you want to be. And like you said, like often the better spots are the small spots, but you leave yourself the avenue to let out more line, let out more line, let out more line as you're fishing to just sort of try different, slightly different angles, slightly different water bottom. That's, that's right. It's like if you, if you start out way up in front of it, you can keep letting more string out and you can keep getting further back. And whether the, the fishing's better or whether your anchor's just not holding, you need to let more rope out. You've got that option if you 
if you start out with your anchor right right in it, you know, it's kind of, and you have to move it, then it leaves you with a lot less options there. All right, man. So I know from experience of fishing with friends that flying the anchor is such a valuable tool to have in your back pocket so that you're not pulling and dropping, pulling and dropping. And so I want to make sure we have plenty of time to sort of talk about that. And I think first off, what you're going to do is tell us what additional gear we need to have to fly the anchor. And then I guess we'll just walk through the same process of, of how flying the anchor works. All right. Um, I guess additional gear, um, for the additional gear, you basically just for getting it in the boat at the end of the day, we need an anchor ring and like a poly ball, preferably. I think the one I fish is, is, is pretty big, but you don't need one that big. Definitely bigger than like the bumper that you would have on the dock or anything, but about a two foot in diameter one will float most, most of your anchors that you've got, like, you know, the orange um, net poly ball. Um, and besides that, you need to make sure very key that you've got something behind your cleat that you're tying it off to. It's not just lag bolted into the bow of your boat or, or whatever, because you're going to be putting a good amount of pressure on it. All right. So walk me through that again, too. So we're, we're our anchors tied up to the bow. And what are you telling me I need to make sure I'm doing before I try flying the anchor? I didn't quite follow. Oh, well, just make sure that, you know, 90% of the boats, newer boats especially, have backing plates on a cleat or, you know, something like that. But you, I always prefer to look at what's behind the cleat that I'm tying a rope off to. You know, especially you're getting in a buddy's boat or, or whatever. It's your first time. You just got the boat. You might look behind there and it's got one little washer on it. And it, it doesn't take very much to, to take the whole cleat out. And it goes okay. down the tank. All right, so the poly ball doesn't come into play until we are ready to finally bring the anchor out of the water for the last time. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. You can need fish for five or six days on commercial trips or, you know, all day or whatever before you ever need the poly ball. All right, so we're not at the poly ball yet because we're not pulling the anchor for the day. We've got the anchor down. We fished the spot out. We have some pretty good success. Now you got another spot on your machine that's, what, like a half a mile away? You know, maybe it's 200 yards away. How do I how do I not pull that anchor out? How do I drag it and get ready for my next spot? All right. So like let's let's say like before we're we're laying at a hundred and let's say we're laying at zero degrees, um, right? De dead dead straight, and we're ready to ready to leave. So first thing you do is you put the boat in reverse to make sure you don't have a bunch of slack anchor rope or, or anything like that. Um, and you, you get the rope tight. At the same time, you've already got somebody back in the back of the boat um, with the rope tied off your cleat. Or, or some people have a little chalk or whatever, but you've got somebody in the back of the boat with a rope ready to catch the line and tie it off and just hold it beside the boat so it doesn't go back under the boat. Um, and then you'll drive off. So you're laying at 180, you'll drive 45 degrees off. Um, take, take your pick to which, whichever side you feel more comfortable on on your compass or on your GPS or whatever, and you'll drive 45 degrees off for, it kind of depends how much anchor rope you have out, but until you get out in front of your anchor and you'll see it over there off to the side, and then you just come right back um, to your anchor course. So if it was 180, as soon as you see your anchor rope beside you or you've drove off 45 degrees either direction for, I generally just do it for about 30 seconds and then come back. Um, my anchor course, you look down and every time, like clockwork, your anchor rope will be right beside the boat. And uh, you have your mate or whoever reach down and grab the anchor rope. I prefer to not do it with a gaff. There's, you know, if you turn the boat and the anchor goes the other way, you can't let go with a gaff. So I, I prefer to just have somebody do it with their hand. They can let go and then tie it off the side of the boat and keep going. So using this technique, we are going to bring the anchor up to the surface. So ultimately the anchor comes up to the surface as we're driving around. Is that correct? Yep. As, a, as a, that, that gets it tied off. And as you're driving, basically before you ever even really tie it off, as you're coming around, you just did a 180 on the anchor. So the anchor's complete opposite and it just pops up. Normally it comes right up at 90, 85% of the time, the anchor comes right up and you just keep driving. You don't even realize it. You look back there and the anchor's floating up on plane. 
And as I'm as I have it tied off and I'm headed to spot number two, suggestion is don't go faster than what when you have the anchor being dragged off the back of the boat. Depends how big of an anchor you've got and same thing how big of a cleat you've got up there. I know guys that'll get up on plane with the anchor behind them. I personally don't go more than like 10 knots with the anchor behind me because, like I said, I'm fishing a 75 pound anchor. Um, and then so how it. does how does dropping the anchor at a second spot differ from the original? Because in the original spot, you know, we've got the anchor in the boat, you know, we're setting our course, we're able to drift because we've got the anchor in the boat. And so are we just imagining that we're on the same course when we get to the next spot? Is that what you do? You just remember that 180 or you remember that 20 degrees or whatever it is, and you just plan on spot number two using that same heading? Yep, that's it. This is the same heading for the most part, unless you're covering a lot of ground. You, you'll have the same anchor heading, um, you know, for most of the day. It might slowly change a little bit if the wind changes or something like that, but yep, you'll have pretty much the exact same anchor course. And on the first spot where I had the anchor in the boat and, you know, you suggested, I forget. So if I got this wrong, let me know. I think you said go maybe two, 300 feet past the spot and then drop the anchor down. Does that math 200 to 300 feet past the spot change when the anchor is already in the water and I'm not dropping it off the front of the boat? Well, when the anchor's in the water, the whole the whole scenario basically changes. Um, so you're you've already got the anchor in the water, so you're driving, but it's behind the boat. So let's say we were laying at 180 degrees before, like like we were. Now I'm, I'm going to be driving up to this number opposite of how I was laying on the boat at 360 degrees, right? And however long, generally, generally I, I start slowing down. I can do a circle in 500 feet. So in five, when I'm about 400 feet from my number, opposite of my anchor course, so it was 180. Now I'm driving to my number at 360, dead opposite of my anchor course. When I get 100 feet in front of, in front of my spot, 200 feet, I'll slow down depending on how fast your boat slows down. Mine, if you're in gear, you're doing seven knots. So I'm pulling out of gear and I'm, when I get, hundred feet from it I'm doing two knots I'm doing a knot and a half when I get 50 feet from it I'm almost stopped I'm maybe doing a half a knot and I come I go in reverse and I swing the boat around because my boat's that boat's 35 foot if I'm in my 50 foot boat and I swing around 50 foot I swing around about 70 foot in front of it so you put it in reverse and your mate unties the rope and the boat swings right around right on top of it all right I follow that, man. So on the first stop, and again, I'm, I apologize that I'm challenged. I bet my readers or our listeners, viewers are following you better than me. But at spot number two, when I'm already driving the anchor behind the boat, I am basically not doing the same course I did with spot number one. I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm driving over the spot, but just dropping it before I get to the spot. You know, is that what I heard? Is that what we're following? That's right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're basically coming exact opposite because you figure you're going to do a 180 because you're dragging the anchor behind you. It's going to end up off your bow. Um, so you're driving right out at exact opposite and you just start slowing down and you just picture that anchor, you know, before you threw it in the water and you're just waiting for it to sink and anchors don't go straight down. You know, they, they do all this crazy stuff on the way down. Um, so you're slowing down and that anchor slowly sinking. And when you get 50 foot from the number and you get ready to spin the boat, that anchor is almost already on the bottom. And sometimes okay. if you slow down too early, it'll catch the bottom a little too early. So you got to make sure that doesn't happen too. Um, but it's, it's already on the bottom, so it's got a lot less distance to travel when you get there. Um, I tell you what, I got one other sort of line of questioning I'm going to give you um, if we're done with this topic. Is there anything? Well, I guess we actually have to pull the anchor out. So now um, we've hit a couple of spots. I've got a couple more question lines for you. We've hit a couple of spots. Now we're ready to head in for the day. Now tell me how I bring that anchor up the easy way, you know, with the, uh, with the ball. All right. So you, you do the same thing. You're, you're sitting on your anchor course um, and you drive whatever your anchor course is, 45 degrees off either direction. See the rope pop up. Your mate ties it off to the um, back of the boat, to the cleat. And then you just 
you pick your your course home. You're normally somewhere around 3:30 or whatever. You're fishing out of here. You start heading home. Turn the autopilot on, or you still you you know you hold the wheel so you don't the boat's not turning all crazy. And then you uh, take your anchor ring, you slide it around your rope, and you take have a little carabiner clip, a nice heavy duty one, and you clip your poly ball to it, and you throw it in the water. And it'll your anchor it'll eventually get down to your anchor, and you'll see your anchor back there with the ball on it. And uh, then you just do a 180, pull your rope in. Right on, man. I I figured that was one of our easier processes. So then my follow up question is. Man, in those unfortunate circumstances when the anchor doesn't want to come up easily, when it's giving you issues, have you learned any tricks of the trade where you can actually save an anchor and you end up not losing an anchor? Well, with that method, um, there's a couple of things you can do. You can keep going. I mean, basically, if it doesn't come free, you'll feel it. I mean, it'll pull your bow tight and, and very, you know, if you're giving it gas, it will be violent. You'll know when it's hung. Um, but you basically can keep driving around in a circle, driving around in a circle, because it'll kind of slowly pull you that direction. And uh, normally, nine times out of 10, you keep right on driving in a circle, and it'll work its way free. If that doesn't work, you come back to neutral and let the boat settle and do it all over again, but this time go the opposite way. So you went 45 degrees to your left the first time. This time, go 45 degrees to your right. That'll get it the, pretty much the other half of the time. And then, like when you say you feel it tight and it is hung, then you just do the circle method. You know, do a full circle 360 around it just to see if there's a direction that finally lets it pop. Oh, I've done donuts for 45 minutes. <laughs> like, did the anchor, you know, you got the anchor off the side of the boat and you don't have it tied off when it's, when it's, in, when it's tight. You know, you don't ever tie it off until it's slack. So when it's tight, it's still tied off in the front of the boat. And it, you know, you're turning off to the left and it's pulling you that way. I've, I've sat there for 45 minutes, more than one occasion, and just circled around the anchor and, and come off of it. And finally, it pops free. Uh, definitely takes time, but it's a lot better than breaking your back doing it. Yeah, okay. Man, uh, Corbett, I, I think this is, concludes our conversation, man. I, I, I got to – first I'll say – any final thoughts on anchoring? Anything I didn't set you up to say? Something you think it might be good for people to to hear? Anything we didn't quite cover that you thought might be good? Uh, that's as well. That's pretty much it. Besides, if you're going to anchor on a wreck, anchor way out in front of it because you want there to be some wreck left. <laughs> All right. Well, then, so my final question has to go back to relax fishing charters. So, clearly we understand that you do bottom fishing, that you have bottom fishing charters. Man, how about a quick walk through the calendar? What is Relax Fishing Charters targeting throughout the year? Like what's your, you know, what do you, what do you most like to take people on? You know, I guess start me in the, start me in the spring and take me to the winter. All right. Well, in the spring we're both boats, the Wasabi and the Relax are here in Moorhead City fishing for Mahi Mahi and, and bottom fish, that sort of thing's always here. Um, primarily target in the springs the mahi um both both boats are same thing here all summer kind of mahis tunas um blue marlins and that sort of thing mix, mixed in um in august uh, we take the wasabi up to ocean city uh, we fish some tournaments up there and some charters out of there um and back here for the rest of the fall on both boats wahoos uh sailfish gets good in the fall time um, we're here through no, the end of November on both boats. Um, bluefin tunas and that sort of thing gets good. And then in the winter time, um, January and February, we are in Marathon, uh, running charters out of Marathon, Florida. Right on, man. Corbett, I have enjoyed this conversation, man. I, you know, I was challenged, but I definitely feel like I understand anchoring better now from our conversation. I, I appreciate your time, man. I appreciate you trying to educate us on anchoring, you know, bottom fish anchoring in the deeper water. Perfect. Thank you guys for having me. Enjoyed it. Yeah, man. Have a good night, Corbett. Yes, sir. You too. Right, Billy. Man. Dude. How'd you're you so do, good. Billy? How'd you do? No, I didn't do. I didn't do well at all, Gary. If you quiz me right now, even with my favorite takeaway, I would fail because I'm like, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. 
Uh, but dude, a ton of information. I feel like somebody who does have a boat, who does have an anchor, who is curious about the subject matter, just got an education. Because I mean, I'm sure if I like halfway understood anything you guys were talking about, I'm sitting there going, "When's he going to talk about a stick it pin where I can put it in my kayak <laughs> and tie a rope to it?" Um, but man, solid. You know, from what I can gather, because I have no experience, but solid information. But what about you, Gary? I'm going to turn the tables. And go, what is Gary's best takeaway as a boat owner, as someone who deals with this, who fishes sometimes off his own boat? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever bought him fish off your own boat or not. Maybe I take my question back. <laughs> um, I have off the 22 foot bay boat, but I also have a GPS trolling motor. So I didn't even pull out the anchor. I mean, I cheated. Uh, I'm only like true. 10 miles out, you know, sometimes yeah. a little bit more than 10. So my boat, not applicable as far as the anchoring goes. I would say, Best takeaway might be, you know, just the explanation of tying the anchor off and moving from one spot to the other spot, and then how you just sort of set up differently as far as dropping the anchor. Also, mm-hmm. like his tip at the end about doing circles, you know, one d- direction, 45 degrees, doing circles, and then that doesn't work because another 45, different 45 degree in circles, because and the anchoring yeah. is expensive stuff, man. No one wants to lose it aside from the inconvenience of not being able to anchor, especially if you've messed it up on the first drop and wasted the trip out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the cost of replacing, man, is why that dude's driving around, Corbett's driving around for 45 minutes, man, especially the size anchor he's talking about. But I'll tell you, here's here's the Gary Hurley takeaway, though. Here's what I'm going to add, because, man, I am a big fan of bottom fishing. And if I had a bigger boat and I was doing more bottom fishing on my own boat, what I would say is, Man, someone just book Corbett and go bottom fishing with him and tell him up front, hey, man, we want to catch fish, but what we really want is an anchoring lesson 101. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be Corbett. I mean, if you've got someone you've bottom fished with before or someone you've got your eye on, like go with them. If you've, if you've invested in a, all the money in a boat that will get you out there to go bottom yeah. fishing, then certainly you can spend dig a little bit deeper, do a charter trip again with the express purpose of making making it an anchoring class. You'll still have plenty of time to fish, but tell the captain, man, I need to see what, what I've been researching and what I've been hearing. I need to see it in play. So I'll have better memory. And I bet a day with Corbett, you know, out of Moorhead Beaufort would not only put fish in the boat, but it would solidify everything he just said. And you would be way more prepared to do it on your own. I mean, I don't want to diss a podcast because man, no. man, this is a great podcast, but a little real world application, yep. I think would go a long way. Yeah, man. That's what I was going to say. You know, I mean, in our videos and our YouTube, our podcast, all that stuff is super informational. I learn a ton, but it's time on the water, baby. Get to get out there and knock it out. Shame on you. Where's my, where's my sound effects? <laughs> oh man. Such a good episode. Thanks. Corbett, once again, uh, for joining us and just dropping a wealth of information. And uh, one day I'm going to go back and listen to that and be like, man, now I know what he's talking about. Uh, or I'm going to book a trip when I get back to the when I get back to North Carolina and, and go check it out. But really appreciate that. And if you guys need some boat accessories, you need all that stuff, maybe you need your boat worked on, uh, feel free to hit up Marine Warehouse Center. They are a great sponsor. Been with Fisherman's Post podcast since early on, and they are always about helping out the fishing community. So if some of the things that we're talking about in this video, you need them for your boat, head over there and see if they have it. Make them your first stop. And if not, I'm sure they know somebody who does. Gary, that was a great episode, man. You did great. Yeah, ask all the right questions. I think <laughs> we'll let I think. viewers tell us otherwise. And uh, and we'll definitely have Corby back on, man. Such a wealth of information. Yeah, man. All Good right, times, man. Billy. See you next time, Gary. Is Corbett still with us?